In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So last night after dinner, we decided to watch a Christmas movie, and our children uh, decided on the miracle of 30, on 4034 Street, with Elliot saying it had to be the original version, not the new one that had come out. And, and so we began watching it, and one of the most likable characters from the second he gets on the screen uh, is, yes, Chris Kringle, but, uh, but Fred Daly who is an attorney who happens to live uh, in the same uh, condo as uh, the uh, woman who's organized the Macy's Day Parade. And as they're watching the parade, she's organizing the parade, and her daughter, uh, Susan, is watching it uh, with this gentleman, Fred, who is uh, watching the daughter to get into good graces with the mother uh, who he has a romantic interest in. And so as they're watching the Macy's Day Parade, he's noticing that the second grader, Susan, uh, doesn't have the eyes of the second grader. She is both wise well beyond her years, but she's also somewhat jaded beyond her years as well. Uh, she doesn't know any fairy tales to believe in them or otherwise. Uh, she uh, doesn't play anybody's fool at the expense of being able to experience the imagination and joy and wonder of things that can't be seen or touched or done. Uh, and he has to for her. Uh, and as he gets to uh, dig a little deeper, he realizes it's the consequence of some of the hurt or disillusionment of her mother. Uh, and as their relationship grows, both with the daughter and with the mother, uh, uh, he comes to have quite an affinity for both of them. Uh, and it, it really pulls on him uh, that, that she isn't a typical second grader, that she doesn't have that incredible imagination, uh, that, that, that undaunting belief uh, in anything, uh, and Santa Claus certainly being part of it. Uh, and then uh, what happens is Chris Kringle, um, who is there at the Macy's Day Parade, realizes that the person charged with playing Santa Claus is a little inebriated, and, uh, and so he throws himself into the spot, uh, he's well received, and he becomes uh, Macy's Santa Claus. Uh, and this all goes wonderfully until he starts uh, telling people instead of uh, uh, pointing children towards overstocked items that they might want for Christmas, uh, to say that we don't have that here at Macy's, but if you go to Gimbal's across the street, you can get it. Or if you go here, you can get it. Uh, but people are so attracted to his, uh, to his warmth and to his, uh, uh, to his lack of guile uh, and his, his Christmas spirit uh, that pretty soon Gimbal's has to respond accordingly and more Christmas spirit begins to fill the air. Uh, until uh, questions uh, about his uh, true identity, and they realize that he believes he really is Santa Claus. Uh, and so they wonder whether they could have a delusional person uh, serving in such an important and public role at Macy's, and so eventually he ends up being on trial. Uh, and that young attorney, Fred, ends up being uh, the lawyer who says, I will represent him in an impossible case to prove that Santa Claus is indeed Santa Claus. And I think one of the most important parts of the story is I think he takes the case not because he believes that this is really Santa Claus, but because he believes hook, line, and sinker in the person, Chris Kringle. This warm person who's brought joy and love and everything uh, that is beautiful about Christmas into the world. And so while he still struggles with, with this person's belief that he really is living <coughs> Santa Claus, he believes in him. And so he fights for his dream. And as he fights for his dream, it comes at the expense of, of, of Fred's uh, perceived dreams. He uh, loses his job or he gives up his job at his, at his law firm that he's been working his way up uh, because uh, who's going to hire somebody that's, that's defending Santa Claus? Uh, and uh, he sort of uh, realized he's made himself unemployable except for uh, being self-employed, uh, but he still believes in Chris Kringle enough to fight for his dream. Uh, and as he continues to fight, uh, he is more and more persuaded uh, by the person of Santa Claus, but he's still defending Chris Kringle's dream. He even uh, proves uh, that Chris Kringle is Santa Claus, or proves that it can't be proven otherwise. Uh, and as he does so, at the very end, you realize that as he's fought tooth and nail for Chris Kringle's dream, that in the end, that his dream, everything that he uh, is somehow wrapped into that his dreams are being fulfilled as he's fighting for someone else's dream. And it's a beautiful story, and uh, the way he does so is so likable 
uh, and so affable, and you see uh, that what he is fighting for is such uh, is such intrinsic values around Christmas: the joy, the generosity, the the, the warmth, uh, the goodness that he finds in this person, and in the end. And the last scene, you realize, as you see uh, Chris Kringle's cane uh, uh, leaning against uh, the fulfillment of all of, of Fred's dreams, that they're so interlinked that in fighting for someone else's dreams, his dreams come true. I bring all this up because I think the story of Joseph is much less a Hollywood version of that story, but it's a story of somebody fighting for someone else's dreams. Joseph is fighting for Mary's dream, is fighting for God's dream, but this is not a convenient dream for Joseph, who's excited to get married uh, and to live a quiet life as a carpenter, uh, and all of a sudden this gets tripped up. First he gets tripped up by Mary uh, conceiving and, and, and bearing a child that is not his. And, uh, how much more convenient would the story have been if God had waited one more year, for that made all the difference in the world, God had waited one more year, waited until they were married, and showed up to both of them at the same time and said, you two, now that you're married, why don't you bear this child? But no, it happens in this particular way. Uh, and I think because God's dream uh, is for all of us, even those whose lives have been turned upside down. And so it comes through these two people whose lives have been turned upside down. We all know Mary's story very well. Uh, and we see how this child growing in Mary uh, becomes part of Mary's dream, that beautiful, beautiful Magnificat about Mary realizing what's growing inside of her is not just God's dream, uh, but her deepest desires as well. Uh, but it's not quite the same with Joseph. Joseph hears from Mary that Mary's her child, and he knows he has nothing to do with it. And uh, he'd love to believe Mary's side of the story, but it's kind of far-fetched, don't you think? They're not married. There's no way to convince people that they are married. Uh, and he knows that he's got two options. He doesn't have three options. He has two options because it says he's a righteous man. He believes in the law. He bends his life towards the law. Uh, and he's going to make his decisions based on what he believes God wants from him. And he gets that from the law. The law gives him two options. One, perfectly within his right, is to expose Mary for what she has done. And to let punishment come to that, which would be dead. And the much more gentle way that still fits into uh, the letter of the law is to quietly dismiss her, to get uh, a couple witnesses to sign a letter of divorce and to have her quietly disappear. Uh, and, and, and Joseph goes about building up a new dream for himself. Uh, and he decides on that way, the gentle way. The idea of keeping her as a, as, uh, as a future wife uh, uh, isn't even part of the, it's against the law. It's against the law. But then Joseph gets visited by an angel. And the angel tells Joseph exactly what Mary probably told Joseph as well. Uh, but that doesn't make life any easier. It's not like Joseph can now go and say, well, no, no, she's right, because the angel came to me too. <laughs> <laughs> and as a male in that particular place, in that particular time, he has ruined his family name. He's ruined his reputation by not following the law, by not dismissing her, by taking her. He has taken an ashamed culture and bestowed infinite amount, amount, amounts of shame upon him. Far more than Fred did by taking on the case of Santa Claus. And he goes and does a favor. You know what an interesting thing about Joseph? Is he doesn't say a word in any gospel. There is not one word ever spoken from Joseph. But he takes on this responsibility. And I believe uh, that the story that we tell uh, as they uh, come in during the pageant and are followed by the innkeeper with his little lantern and there's no room at the end, the beautiful quaint story that we tell is really a story about a family that won't take in their own because of the shame that's been brought upon the family. That Joseph goes to his ancestral town uh, with a wife who's nine months pregnant and nobody makes room. And the word isn't really for in, it's for uh, a guest room. Uh, and I'm sure there's a family member with a guest room. And anybody in that culture with how revered childbearing was, remember that's how you out your ancestors out under the stars, would have made room for a pregnant woman unless she was scandalized beyond all acceptability. And so there was no room for her. And that's what Joseph took on. The embarrassment of his family, faithfully, 
so that Mary could realize her dream, so that God's dream could be realized, so that the dreams of all of, of, of Joseph's ancestors, that swords would be beaten into plowshares, so the spirits would be turned into pruning shooks, so that lambs would lie down with sheep, and our lambs would lie down with lions, and all of those, uh, uh, all of those dreams would be realized. <coughs> of this simple little dream, to have a simple life, to live without shame, to just start his own thing, but someone takes it off. Quiet, without any fanfare, without any Sunday dedicated to him, he takes it off. And without that, we don't get the realization of the dream that brings us here, that will bring us here a week from now. The light that came into the world that shows to us beyond any shadow of doubt the darkness doesn't trump light. So that we would have hope for another day or tomorrow. So I invite you, as you think about your journey this next week, uh, as you walk into Christmas, how are you championing the dreams of those you love? Even if they come to your own how are you championing the dreams of those close to you? How are you championing God's dream? How are you bringing that beautiful uh, view that God has that all of the lowly would be lifted up, the Beatitudes, that the blessings uh, would be upon those uh, who are hurting and disenfranchised and lost, that we might wake up with a sense of hope that there might be a day where there's no need for sword or spear or gun or weapon. How are we ambassadors of dreams? Peacemakers. Just like Fred, when he championed Chris Crinkle's dream, his own dream came true. When we champion God's dream, we're amazed at the way our own dreams come true. But how are we being dream makers in the world?